We have such a conversation to have today and three remarkable women to do it with, as you can see. Grabbing back, women in the age of Trump. And we're going to be looking at some of the key questions regarding the Trump presidency, why, how, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what happened, <laughs> what's continuing to happen, what will happen. I think that enough will keep us going. We're going to look at the contrast between um, a public belittling and, and, and a private and technologically fueled uprising. And we're going to try to work out if any of those are in any way linked. Um, my name is Julia Baird. Um, I write and do various things. And one of the things I do do is go back and forth to the States where I've tapped into the, the struggles of Americans around the Trump presidency. I was at, as I was telling Francesca before, I was at the meeting where, um, at the New York Times editorial meeting, where they grilled Donald Trump about his policies for an hour. Um, and I was sitting next to him, and I was trying to work out the hair and the eyes. No one ever talks about the eyes, actually, because they're kind of pure white. He, he handed out ratings, he handed out his ratings and his audience views, he talked about how well he did on The Apprentice, um, wasn't that strong on a lot of policy. Um, and when I came back to New York the next time, just a few months later, so many people I knew were heavily medicated and um, <laughs> my friends who were therapists were fully booked out, including with, um, with couples therapy, which I thought was fascinating, if people disagreed on this. But, who we're hearing from today are these three women, these three strong voices in America. And Francesca Donna has this fantastic, from the New York Times, is a director of what's called the Gender Initiative, which was in the pipeline for quite some time, and it aims to elevate the views, the diverse views of diverse groups of women in the newsroom and through the, um, all the various platforms the New York Times operates on, but it came out, um, it launched on just as the Harvey Weinstein story was breaking, which was incredibly fortuitous, and she's been very, very busy ever since then. Sophia Nelson is a long-term moderate Republican, as we've discussed before, someone who wrestles with being a Republican. She's just written a book, her latest book, E Pluribus One, about the founding fathers and their vision for a united America, how that was fraught at the time, and indeed remains fraught now. And she's also a best-selling author, um, a journalist based in DC, who is a corporate diversity champion award winner, a global motivational speaker. Fran Leibowitz is the patron saint of all nocturnal people, <laughs> of the literary-minded, and she says of the slothful, although I'm yet to be entirely convinced as, she, as she's flown all this way um, to talk to us about, the, the patron saint of people who believe that words and ideas matter. Uh, she's also the author of the best-selling essay collections, Metropolitan Life and Social Studies. And I would recommend to all of you, if you have not seen the documentary that Martin Scorsese did of her life in, in 2010, where he basically placed a microphone in front of you, um, look it up. It is really fantastic. So everyone, if we can please just welcome these three women. <laughs> I want to start, first of all, by asking each of you where you were at the moment that you discovered that Donald Trump was going to be the President of the United States, and what was running through your mind at that moment, Francesca? Hi. Hi. First of all, um, great question. Uh, so it's always very interesting to be in a newsroom, actually, when these things are happening, um, because you get... Um, to say that you're at work, and so you're sort of processing things in a slightly different way, which is, what's, gonna, what's the front page going to look like tomorrow? What's the story going to be? What's the headline? What photograph are we going to choose? But I think along with um, so many people, we were quite surprised. Um, the, the start of the day, uh, we had a certain opinion about what the front page was going to look like 24 hours from now, um, and that was certainly reflected in our news meeting. 
which we have around 9.30 in the morning. And um, I do know that um, over the course of the day, we were so certain about what was going to happen that we even sort of set a front page with um, a different person um, featured in the photo. <laughs> we all remember it. We remember the needle flipping through Yes, time. and yes. so um, I think that was sort of a radical switch that we had to make in our heads and realize this is what's going on, but at the same time, being in a newsroom, you're covering it, you're doing a job, you've got to get the story, <laughs> and we had to get it fast. And so to me, it was sort of, wow, this is happening, and a lot of surprise, but also we've got to get the job done. Mm. So it was a lot of sort of manic, right. get this done, and a lot of, you know, there's so much sort of preparation work that goes into these things, and you sort of, you sort of pre-write a whole lot of stories when you think something is a sure thing, and then the sure thing is not a sure thing, mm. and then you change. And that was <laughs> a busy, busy day, as you can imagine. <laughs> What about you, Sophia? I'm going to answer the question in two ways. I was on air on Hardball, <clears throat> and we were watching the returns come in, and it became apparent that there was a problem. And um, <laughs> depending on what perspective you were coming from, I, I, by the way, grew up with Kellyanne Conway, who's Trump's, was his campaign manager, and, and we're 12 days apart in age, actually, so I know her quite well. And uh, so I was watching and I began to text with some people in the Clinton campaign and they said, don't worry, we're going to hold, it's Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. Those are the firewall. Well, when Pennsylvania fell, I said, what are you doing now? Michigan and Wisconsin. Well, we all know what happened. So, but when I knew Donald Trump was going to win the election, happened in September of 2016, I live in Virginia, and I live on the border between West Virginia and Virginia, so it's more rural, uh, out near Dulles Airport, if you've ever been to the States. And I was coming back from a conference, I have a convertible, I'm driving with the top down, it's autumn, it's good, and I'm taking the back routes, which is more rural, and I see nothing but Trump signs in every state I go through, and I said, oh my goodness, Trump's gonna win this election. And I remember going home and telling my friends and family, they're like, you're stupid, Sophia, he's not gonna win the election. I'm like, you didn't see what I saw through parts of Pennsylvania, southern New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, there were big Trump signs. They weren't little, they were big. And I thought, something's, we're missing something. We're disconnected. He's tapped into something. So I knew this was not going to go in the right direction in September. So mm. that's my experience. Mm. Fran, and in New York, I remember 2008 when Obama was, I was there when he was elected and there was dancing in the streets. I went up to Harlem and there was such a feeling of effervescent hope and joy. How was it when Trump was elected? Less joy. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I wasn't in Harlem, but I'm sure a lot less joy in Harlem. Um, every presidential election, the night of it, I go to a friend's house. You know, we watch it on TV. We have dinner. I'm sure there have been good ones and bad ones. There were two Obama good ones. There were two George Bush very bad ones. But the, the day of the, this election, the whole day, I was in a fantastic mood. And this is something that happens maybe once a decade. Uh, <laughs> Was there a reason for it? Yes. I thought, it's over. You know, it was a year. You know, I thought, it's over, and we're not going to see Trump anymore. You know, and at the time, I lived in Soho, and I was meeting a friend of mine who lived in the village. We voted in the same place. We met. We voted. We went to lunch. The streets were... This is, you know, like one in the afternoon of the day. The streets are filled with happy people. We're already happy because it's over. Um, and because we do actually think this neighborhood, this is the world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we go to lunch, everyone is in a good mood. As I'm walking, actually, up West Broadway, there's a restaurant on the other side of the street, which I don't like, I never go to, but which I knew, actually, that Harvey Weinstein was having an after party there, a victory party for Clinton, after the big party for, you know, the people who don't give $10 million to Hillary Clinton, that was at the Javits Center. And I was not invited to this party, but I thought, I'm going to crash this party <laughs> because I want to go to this big party. And so I see the guys from the restaurant putting these velvet ropes out. This is one in the afternoon. So the waiter's putting the ropes out, and I thought, I wonder if these guys will recognize me. So I walk on that side, and one of them goes, Miss Liebowitz, you're coming to the party afterward. I said, yes, I am. <laughs> uh, so I went to uh, lunch. Everyone in the street was saying, in fact, there, I ran to a friend of mine who used to be the editor of Time magazine. 
And he had, you know, his phone, and he goes, he's telling me all his sources. You know, these guys, they have all these sources. The sources are all wrong. Mm. Oh, she's going to have 400 million electoral votes. Um, I go to my friend's house. Everybody was in a fantastic mood. Um, everybody. There were, and there was champagne. This is before dinner. Everyone's drinking champagne. Everyone's having a fantastic time. The TV was on in the kitchen, but we were eating in the dining room. The kitchen, but you had to go in the kitchen and get the food. So I'm in the kitchen. Everyone's fantastic time. I go out. I have to preface this by saying, in case I already have not spoken long enough, that there are three days of my life where I remember every second. Okay? <laughs> so I've already edited this down if it seems like it's been long. And I'm going to spare you the other two days, but I remember every second of the day of the Kennedy assassination. Okay? And I was 13 years old. And I could tell you what I was wearing. I will not. Um, <laughs> I remember every second of September 11th. And I remember every second of this night, and I will never forget it. You know, to me, it was as traumatic as those other two days. Uh, and at a certain point, I go into the kitchen to get some food, and they have the map, you know, the green, the blue and red map up. Mm. I look and I think, what's that? And I think, oh, it's too early. So I go back and eat, I come back out, I look at it. And th well, they did something, that I don't know what TV network this was. They're, they're not supposed to. Um, call a state before every poll is closed across the country. They're not supposed to do that, but they were doing it. And so I was like, so I sit and I start looking at it. A guy who's at dinner comes in, he sits down, and this poll falls, everyone's looking. And at a certain point, when it became like apparent, I, I'm not sure apparent is the right word, but there was a high chance this friend of mine, a very distinguished, eminent presence in New York, said, I'm going home, I have to go home and take drugs. <laughs> so not only is this a distinguished man, he's also, you know, a man of a certain age. He said, what do you mean take drugs? <laughs> so he, he, said, he said, I said, I said you, know, you know, 60 years at this job, he goes, I can't take this. And he left. When I left later, um, you know, the streets in these neighborhoods are always full of people. On a regular Tuesday night at three in the morning, the streets were empty. Empty. It was just like the night of September 11th. Exactly like that. The streets were empty, you know, and I went home and I have not recovered at all. By the way, not in one bit have I changed. My feelings not changed. I haven't gotten used to it, you know. I have not adapted to it. I'm not as flexible as you might imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and I am not adapting to it. Mm -hmm. Did you feel it as a physical shock, like a lot of people seemed to? I was completely shocked. Oh, also, I spent an entire year... The the year of the campaign, I spent the entire year going around the country saying to people, don't worry, there's zero chance he could win. Zero. You know, and the truth is that, you know, people always say, New Yorkers are so provincial, and I always say, yeah, but it's New York. So it's you who are provincial. We're not provincial, we just don't pay attention to you. And there's why, <laughs> okay? And truthfully, I don't care what these people want. I know you're not allowed to say that, you know, but when people say, you know, I tell you what I'm, I was really sick of. I was really sick of men telling me what Hillary Clinton did wrong. I was super sick of that. And I, I have to tell you, and I kept saying to people, you know, <laughs> Trump didn't win because he did something right. Trump won because he did something wrong. So it's a crazy thing to say. But I was also very angry at Bernie Sanders, who I hated from the beginning. I know that's against the law, you know. <laughs> I mean, the, the year before the election, you know, uh, whenever I would say I would hate Bernie Sanders, I would get booed by my own audience, people who paid to see me. They would boo me, you know. Um, and I, I'd like think to myself, you know, I understand how a college student might be fooled by this guy. You know, I mean, you're in college. He says college should be free. You love him. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, if someone said, you know, apartments in Manhattan should be free, I'm voting for you. You know, but, but I also think college should be free, by the way. You know, but what free means is we pay for it, which is fine. Use my money for that. Don't give it all to Bill Gates, you know. So <clears throat> I felt uh, Sanders really demonized her, you know, Bernie mm -hmm. Sanders. And also, you know, what I would say about him was, what kind of person leaves New York when they're 18? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You think it's the wrong direction, right? right that's the wrong direction. <laughs> okay, so, you know, that's who he was. And when people, especially young women, you know, would say to me, but I don't like Hillary Clinton. I don't like her. Mm. I would say, so what? Don't worry, she's not going to call you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. You don't have to like the president. 
Right. You know, you have to like your friends. That's it. But what did you attribute that to? That the fact that the debate became reduced to her likability, because a lot of Democrats afterwards were saying we just should not have put her up as a candidate. There was this kind of sober realism that, unfair or not, um, and deeply sexist or not, that that made them, the, the Democrats vulnerable. Well, that is because you know people feel they should like the president. You know, yeah, the, you know, that's one of the reasons that Bush won. You know, because people didn't like John Kerry. You know, and I, you know, I would say to people, you know, I had a doorman who voted for George Bush, and I said, "What are you talking about? You're in a union. How could you vote for George Bush?" You know, he goes, "But I don't like John Kerry," and I thought, you know, I know John Kerry. I don't like him either. But don't worry about it, Greg. You're not going to hear from him. <laughs> you know, I mean, <clears throat> so that you know, we think when I say we, I mean them. I mean Americans. Um, they think that the president should be charming, that he should like the president, like he's an entertainment figure, you know, which is why when Oprah Winfrey makes a speech that everyone likes, everyone says, Oprah Winfrey should be the president. <laughs> you know, and you know, my feeling when that happened was, I really hope Oprah Winfrey does not want to be the president, because right. there's no question but that she could be the president because she's the most popular person in the country. Right. The truth is, the most popular person in the country is always an entertainer. You know, the most popular person in the country used to be Elvis Presley. You know, right. doesn't mean to be a good president. And Sophia, if I, if I can bring, come back to you on the question of it was presented as, as such a shock and such a surprise, and there's questions about what the media got wrong and how polling went wrong, um, which are you know, fairly, fairly serious analytical questions. But you believe that in some ways it, it was a natural trajectory that Trump is understandable. Can you explain that? Well, you've got to go back 25 years of the Republican Party, starting with Ronald Reagan, then Father Bush, then W, and then ultimately you get Donald Trump. And it, the, the, the Republican Party, since take the 1960 election, is where the sea change happens for John F. Kennedy calls Coretta Scott King, and he gets the first time as a Democrat the majority of black votes, although Nixon was still getting 40-some percent of black voters. But as each Republican election went past Jerry Ford and on to Reagan, that black vote and of color vote drop significantly for the Republican Party so that Donald Trump would be the natural growth out of this didn't surprise me and people of color at all in America because, it, let's face it, he ran very openly and said things that a lot of people were thinking. Demographics is really at the core of what happened in the 2016 election. In any culture and civilization on earth, dating back to the Garden of Eden. Whenever there is a demographic shift, you saw it with Brexit, you're seeing it, nationalism occurs. The majority in America is Caucasian. There's a backlash. Now, Van Jones called it white lash. I don't know if you heard that, and I know that may be offensive to some, but step out the box and understand that whether it's immigration, whether it's Black Lives Matter, people of color, there's a fear I hear this where I live in America all the time, where the people, we have guns, Confederate flags. We just had a big debate in America over keeping Confederate statues and honoring them and flags and guns. There is a big segment in my country that does not like the direction of women, the way women are going, the way people of color are going, the way that things are going, and there's fear. It's real palpable fear. Our jobs have been lost. Our country is going our country, you like those words? I want my country back. That's a very common refrain when you get below the Mason-Dixon line and the Rust Belt, which is where Trump did very well. Mm. So it's a lot more complicated than just to say we didn't like Hillary. Hillary had 25 years of public life that qualified her in every way to be president of the United States, but her likability factor was a problem from the moment she became first lady. They just didn't know how to deal with a strong, smart, self-assured woman. She should be president based on qualifications alone. There's nobody that was more qualified than her, but Trump won, I believe, because two things, demographics and the fear of a woman. White males, I wanna be polite when I say this. They, 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 <laughs> White men were not having it. It was bad enough that we just had this black man be president for eight years. Let me just go on and say it. It was bad enough. Now we're gonna have a woman too? I don't think so. So there was a 
the media played a role. I thought the way she was treated was horrific. Mm -hmm. We never would treat a man the way we treated her. Whether you like her or not or wanted to vote for is not the issue. So it's demographics, one. And then the second part of this in America is Trump is a reality TV figure. And unfortunately, we like that. We like the housewives of Atlanta. I don't know if you know about them here. We like that <laughs> kind of trash. We like that he'll say something. The media loved him because ratings went mm -hmm. through the roof. And the media knew if he became president, ratings would go through the roof. And guess what? They have. Mm -hmm. We talk about him nonstop, 24 hours a day in America. We can't even keep up with our own news cycle. That's my opinion. But you've talked about demographics. How do you... <laughs> <clears throat> What are we to make of the fact that white women voted for him? You know, I'm not a white woman. I'm a woman of color. 90% of black women voted for Hillary Clinton. 53% of white women voted for Donald Trump. It tells a story, we were talking about this behind, and I wanna know what you think about this, the, 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 the gender discrimination, colorism, whatever, within gender. White women see things one way, women of color another. Nowhere was that more stark than in the election of 2016, but I think that those white women voted for their husband's economic interest. You know what I mean when I say that? Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they're married, you, you gotta break it down. Look, they, J Judge Roy Moore, a, child, a molester of girls, mm -hmm. and they're women of faith holding press conferences defending this guy. We got a long way to go as women, we do. Mm -hmm. we Can I, can How I do say, we understand yeah, that Can I vote? say a yes. few things about the, the white women, which I think, you know, after all this happened, the Times was asking questions sort of what, how can we unpack that for our readers? Because it, it, felt, it felt a bit surprising to us. And, um, and we have a wonderful journalist at the Times named Susan Cheer, and she went out, out, out through the country and really tried to find a lot of white women who had voted for Trump and really understand what it was and what were some of the things that came up. So the first thing is so clearly the thing that we've all been kind of circling around, which is, I didn't want to vote for her. Mm -hmm. So that was some part of the reason, but there were also these other things which were my religious freedom, my, my, my religious um, ability to express myself, that might be impinged. Um, concerns, about, um, concerns about abortion, concerns about uh, healthcare, which people felt was just too expensive. And I think also we really can't forget the fact that there was an opening on the Supreme Court at that time mm. and whether Hillary Clinton filled it or Donald Trump filled it was really, really material and was going to have massive impacts on the country mm. and the direction that things took. So, and I, and I think the, the economy also was a big thing and, and, and this sort of idea of, you know, if you just look at, at the slogan that Trump had, make America great again, this idea of sort of bringing it back to a time of, I'm not quite sure what time it was that people wanted 1953. to bring it, <laughs> bring it back to. <laughs> that was a dream. <laughs> no, vote for me, it'll be 1953 again. Yeah. Giuliani I mean, did the same thing when he ran for mayor the first but, time. But it was, it was never labeled as such. There was sort of this idea of sort of going back to this sort of comfort place that, that, that things felt sort of safe and good and again, but for who, right? Yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I think sort of really trying to sort of unpack and understand mm. those stories and really sort of get inside their heads and, and say, you know, wh why was this important to you? But look at what's happened post-Trump's presidency yes the last year. Race in America has never, I'm too, I'm not old enough to remember the civil rights movement, but I can't believe what I've seen happen at UVA in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. Young white men, these aren't old bitter white men carrying flags and confederacy things. They, these are young men in their 20s marching with torches, shouting anti-Semitic things in the open with Nazism and they're, these are not fringe crazy guys. These are your boy next door. They go to college. Mm -hmm. They're educated. There's something really ugly afoot. They're stupid. I'm sorry? Stupid. Yes. They're stupid. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 Trump's appeal is he's stupid. He, and you were, I, I mean, I agree with you about Reagan, but to me, you know, it's that Reagan was a template for the stupid president. Before Reagan, there was no idea the president could be stupid. We hated Nixon, <laughs> but no one thought he was stupid. We just thought he was evil. You know, until Reagan, it never occurred to us the president could also be stupid. Mm -hmm. So you have Reagan, the stupid president. You have George W. Bush, the even dumber president. <laughs> Then you have Sarah Palin, 
very important to Donald Trump. And so it got to a point where obviously, it, you know, the president can't be too stupid, you know, and it makes people feel good. You know, it makes, because most people are also stupid. Um, <laughs> and, you know, whenever people say, you know, about, you know, Trump is crazy, I say, he's a little crazy, you know, but mostly he's dumb. Um, and his appeal, I think his appeal, was almost entirely racist. I, I, I watched those rallies, those campaign rallies, and I am old enough. And they reminded me exactly of George Wallace rallies. And I kept saying to people, George Wallace ran for the presidency and, on a segregation ticket. Segregation now, segregation forever, and the rallies were exactly the same. They were Klan rallies, you know? So I believe that the people who voted for Trump, who still like him, that even though he did not reopen the coal mines, even though they're never gonna get reopened, even though, you know, they're not gonna be working on the Ford line for $30 an hour ever again, and they know it, um, it's enough for them that they can express their bigotry that is more important to them than their own lives. The sad thing is, though, they don't see it that way. Mm. Again, I, care. Uh, I live in, in Virginia. Northern Virginia is not the same as below Richmond, Virginia, but out west where I am, which is on the West Virginia border, it, it, it is a lot of what you said, and they do not see this as a race issue at all. You can talk about it to your blue in the face that will not be conceded. Mm -hmm. They really believe is their institutions are under attack, their country is under attack. And I try to explain to people the very notion that you would say that something is yours, that it belongs to you and not to everyone else in America, is in and of itself pretty racist. And if you can't figure that out, I really can't help you. But that's because so, they're stupid. Yeah. Why is this not coming up? It's not can complicated. I, can I also, can I just, yes. sorry. I mean, also to add to the race is, issue is also the gender issue. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's quite remarkable mm. actually that um, over the course of the campaign, these, these allegations of sexual abuse bubbled up again and again, comments that I can't repeat right now on TV mm -hmm. were uttered, also denied, but we had them on tape. And none of this was a deal breaker for all of these white women who voted for him anyway. Yeah, yeah so can I just ask you, Fran, we've seen, we've, we've discussed the emboldening of, you know, of white supremacists and other groups um, during the time that Donald Trump has been president. What has happened to women, do you think? What are we witnessing amongst women? I'm sorry, in what way? As in, as in technologically, as in the, the discussion around assault and a kind of an anger around sexism, women becoming a lot more vocal and active. And, and but I know a lot of people think it's related to Trump. I don't. You don't? No, not at all. You know, I, I don't think the Me Too movement is related to Trump. You know, I think it was um, almost chance, you know, and just incredibly lucky and something I never, it never occurred to me it would change. I mean, I, I was as surprised by this as I was by the Trump election, you know, because it's been, you know, the way women are treated by men has been the same, you know, in 1512, 1612, 1812, 1912, and then in nine weeks it changed, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, I think, you know, in the case of Harvey, for instance, yep. um, who you, you know, know, you mean, I you know, know very well, I know all these guys. Leon I know probably 90% of the, you know, and I knew all these stories about Harvey, but I never heard the rape stories. Of all the stories, most of which I knew, and most of which everyone knew, and when you see these actors saying, I never heard about that's just a lie, okay? Um, but the rape, the, cr the criminal aspect of it, I never heard either, you know? Uh, and I never, you know, but the truth is that Harvey's business, not the sexual assault business, which he had on the side that I didn't know about. <laughs> but the, the movie business, yeah. um, it was in decline. It never would have happened before that. Don't nice. kid yourself. Right. When Harvey was, you know, standing on top of that mountain and in control of every Academy Award, mm -hmm. no one would have said a word. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, he was vulnerable to that because just the way in Hollywood, as soon as you start to slip, you, that's it. They go after you no matter what. And I think that's why he was vulnerable. And then it was just this incredibly yeah. wonderful cascading thing, one after another, like all the guys you couldn't stand the most. One, it was really, it wasn't as great as Trump not would be in the president, but it was pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you agree that those, I mean, because the Times have been reporting on Weinstein, which was the trigger moment for me too, for, you know, for quite some time. How, how do you view... Um, the time of Trump and the rise up of the Me Too movement. Okay, so uh, there's a lot to that, but I think, I think that the political backdrop really did actually have an impact on everything that was going on. I think that um, 
all of these sort of movements as they were occurring started to sort of lay the groundwork for Me Too. So you had Black Lives Matter, then you had Trump being elected, and then um, a whole lot of women said, my goodness, look at what's just happened. And men too, by the way. A lot of women and men said, what's just happened? So you, then you started to see the rise of these marches. Then you had the Harvey reporting that was going on at the New York Times. The Harvey story breaks. It's huge, it's, it's radical and major because these stories have kind of been bubbling around the edges for years and decades and no one really ever able to do anything mm -hmm. about it or stories that were, you know, um, you know, incidents that were brought to the police were sort of disappeared or, you know, money was thrown at the problem and, and lawyers were thrown at the problem and all manner of kind of quashing what was happening. So you had the Harvey story that breaks, and then the stage is really set by all of that that had come before with the marches that people felt, I actually can speak out. And suddenly you had the Me Too thing where all of these small, not small to the individual, but where all of these individual stories were being told, these stories that might have been whispered mm -hmm. to your friend in confidence, or possibly, you know, maybe you tell your mom or whatever, that they were so small and maybe someone would believe you, maybe they didn't. Suddenly you had these things that were just blasting out on social media, and the whispers became what I think of as a roar, and you could not put all of those Me Too stories back in the box after that. I also think it helped that people like Selma Hayek came out, and Lupita yes. Luongo, and some of the most famous actresses in the world saying, or those who got stalled, and now we know why their career stalled. It's happened to women in this room. It's happened to those of us up here where you pissed off the wrong guy for whatever reason, and you paid a price for it. But one of the things that we haven't talked about that I think is critical to mention up here mm -hmm. is the Christian evangelical alignment with Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. It is the most stunning, appalling thing to me. I've written a lot about it over mm -hmm. the last number of weeks. I just had a piece. There's this book out in America right now called The Faith of Donald Trump by Brody and these guys, and I just dissembled that whole thing in an article that I wrote about. It's fake faith, and I hate to call somebody's faith fake, but I read this scripture that says faith without works is dead, so therefore if you can treat, the way he talks on Twitter alone is problematic, but the white evangelical Christian movement, which is always has roots in the Republican Party and is conservative, you go back to Reagan and Daddy Bush, the Christian coalition, they've kind of been revived again through Donald Trump. Here's a man that I haven't seen go to church once, once since he's been president, mm -hmm. He calls it 2 Corinthians instead of 2 Corinthians. He doesn't have a clue what scripture actually means. He's the most ungodly man I've ever seen, and they love him. So again, it goes back to this fringe element within the new Republican Party that has infected it in a way that it's not the party of Lincoln anymore. It's not Dwight Eisenhower's Republican Party anymore. It's a very different Republican Party. And I, I just think that race is the subtext mm -hmm. and gender because in the evangelical world, women, you've seen Beth Moore, people like that in the Southern Baptist movement where women are kind of pushed down. You had Christine Kane, one of your own from here, who's amazing. She, she's one of the voices where they've been loud about how women get treated in the church. And so it is, <clears throat> Trump has really tapped into all the elements of sexism and yep. racism and it's simply unbelievable that he's the president of the United States of America. It's very sober. It was, it was fascinating to watch how quickly Me Too became Church Too. Yes. And if you, if you analyse yes. what was being Great said hashtag. in Church Too was domestic abuse, actually. Absolutely. So it was very much what was happening in yep. the homes, um, yep. which kind of erupted. But then what happens with all of this? What happens with these stories and this dissent? Are you hopeful, Fran? about the future and where to for here, particularly in the wake of, of, this, of this agitation. You mean about the Me Too movement? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure hopeful is the word you're looking for, but I've never actually, <laughs> I've never actually thought about that concept, so I can't really answer, but um, <laughs> um, there are certain things that are not gonna go back, that is for sure. For me, um, I would prefer that people concentrated less on movie stars you know, mm -hmm. um, who are at any rate not the most um, generally admirable people on the face of the planet Earth, and more about 
uh, women who work at McDonald's, you know, women who work in factories, uh, uh, women who make beds in hotels, who are the slaves of the janitor on that floor, mm -hmm. um, you know, who can't say anything because they make six dollars an hour and they need to make that six dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. um, those are the people that these female movie stars who are now in a better position, as, as, as if that was possible, um, they should concentrate on those women because that is the thing that is really important. You know, you don't have to be a movie star if you don't want to be, um, but everyone wants to be. But if you're making beds in a hotel, you have to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, and you, and the people, that, the men that they are under the thumb of, you know, are sometimes 20 year old boys, you know, who are the night manager at their Burger King, you mm -hmm. know, and these stories are truly horrible. You know, but I do absolutely think it's not going to go back. But I also do not think that you're going to turn around and find out that women own these companies because that's the power. You know, the power in the United States, it's the power, you know, of capitalism. Who owns it? Mm. You know, whose house is it? Who can say, get out of my house? You know, and that's men. Mm. So, you know, in the corporate world, um, which I'm obviously not that familiar with and would have done very poorly in, of course. Um, <laughs> you know, it's men who run everything. You know, right. I have a friend who always says, men, they own the joint. And that's true about whatever the joint is. You know, as far as what you were saying before about the evangelicals, it's abortion. That's all they care about. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they care about that 100%. That's why they wanted, what's his name, in the, in the um, Supreme Court? You know, they are obsessed with abortion, mm -hmm. not with babies. It's not like these guys care about babies. It's about women. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I don't care what any man thinks about abortion. I have zero interest. I don't think the father should get to say, unless you're pregnant. I don't really care. You know. <clears throat> I mean, Barney Frank, who was a fantastic congressman from Massachusetts, he's retired. Barney Frank uh, once said, um, Republicans, they only care about human life from conception to birth. After that, you're on your own. <laughs> um, you know, now, we're just, just to say, we're, we're, we're just about to open it up to questions, so if you can just get ready to think about that, and we have two microphones here and here, but if I can just get each of you to respond to what Fran was saying and also the question of whether, what you think all of this means. Well, my hope is, we were talking about this in the green room, we've got to start having a conversation about our boys, our brothers, our sons, our husbands, etc. The issue, it's great to focus on Me Too and what's happened to us as women, but if you don't change the behavior of men, it ain't gonna get better. And the only way we do that is we have to start teaching boys from the time we're little how to value women and respect them as equals and, and not to, you know, you know how in schools when a little boy likes you, he pulls your hair and there's this mm. aggressive behavior. He really wants to kiss you, but he hits you. It's kind of crazy, right? But we know that's been happening forever. And so we have to teach boys and men mm. to value women Otherwise, this does not change. That is a critical part of this conversation that we're not having. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, to respond to both of you as best I can. So I agree with you. We need to be having this conversation with boys and girls as well. This is not a one-sided conversation, and we need to work out how we interact with one another. I think one of the really great things that has come about because of this is a lot of men, at least men I know, are having the conversation and wondering, what does my behavior mean? What does it mean if I do this or don't do that? Or how does it feel when someone says something like this to you? And really asking themselves, how do I operate in this workplace now? And I think that's a question that a lot of women have asked themselves, but not a lot of men. So I'm really um, excited to see that happening with a lot of men. And then also to just, to just draw on your point, I'm so glad you raised the, the millions of women who are doing anonymous, unexciting, not very sexy jobs, who are doing incredibly hard work, who cannot speak out about what is happening because it really could, in fact, endanger them. And I think one of the things we're trying to do at the Times is really start telling those stories. Fine, it started at the top. It started on, you know, red carpets and glamour, and perhaps that helped this become a story that people could latch onto because you knew who um, all of these stars were and you had seen them and you felt an element of familiarity with them because you'd seen them in so many movies. But I think now we have to really, really think about what this means for the ordinary person and um, workplaces and jobs at every single level. It's essential. Mm -hmm. 
And is this where you're trying to drive the reporting as well? I mean, I've yeah. noticed the Times has been doing yeah. car manufacturing yeah. and so on. Is that what's that's going right? To be I mean, I think that's a really important thing mm. to cover. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I really want to see us um, covering is really looking at sort of what is next for women. There's a there's a lot, a lot, lot, lot more women running for political office this year. Yeah. Their numbers are just extraordinary. Look at what happened in Virginia and in 2017. The, the, the old Dixie South, the Confederacy was headquartered in Virginia. And women running changed the landscape. The state is very blue now. Women who never, we had one lady who's transgender when Danica, I, I, I think her name's Danica, I don't remember her name, but she beat this conservative Republican guy who refused to even acknowledge her during the debate, talk to her, and she beat him. And he's been in office 30 years. Right. So people, it's changing, and it's. I think that's big. a. I think that's a really big story to watch, and let's yeah. see what happens in this in this election. Are you going to run, Sophia? Oh, uh, someday, sure. Yeah, as an ind. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Someday. As an independent. I'll probably run as a Republican, but I'll change the Republican Party. I worked for Christy Whitman, which you had in your intro. She was the first female governor of New Jersey. And there are the moderates will get the party back because Trump will do such damage to the GOP that it will have to start over again. I believe okay. that. Goals. It's the goals. All right. I'm just opening it up to questions now. If I could go to you, number three. Yes. Oh. Lucky first. I'm a bit short. Um, <laughs> I, I just have a question about democracy in the US and the state of women within that. At the recent um, conservative conference, a leading Republican uh, woman, Mona, I've forgotten her last name. Sharon. Sharon. She yes. was booed on stage because she criticised Trump. And I was just wondering, where does that leave women's voices within the Republican movement? Mm. Are they being drowned out? And... And what does that mean for the state of democracy? Is, is any criticism just shut down? Well, I'll take that. You remember during the election in 2016 when the tape came out. Mm -hmm. There were Nikki Haley, the UN. I'm really surprised he put her in the cabinet. That shocked me because she was unequivocally tough on him. And she made a statement about what he said, as did, what, over 200 and some Republicans did, a lot of them women. But once he won... It was a different ball game, and so I think that what's happening in the GOP now is people are telling Paul Ryan, good friend of mine, 25 years. I'm, I'm in, I just, I don't know what to say. I, I've never seen anything like the power he seems to have over these people, not to say what's right and what's wrong. I'm not sure I know what that's about, but I do think that again after 2020, if Trump is not reelected, which I pray God he is not, but if he is not okay. reelected in 2020, um, you don't think he will be, friend? I don't think he'll be in office then. We'll see. The, well, I, we'll see. But uh, that's, that's a fair point with the investigations. That, I mean, that's another topic we can talk about. But mm, mm. I think that 2020 is going to tell us a lot. If he gets reelected, wow, I don't know what to say, what that means. But I think that the, the Republican Party is going to be in a lot of, it's in trouble, but it's going to be really damaged when he's done. Really damaged. Mm, the question being the big tent. Yeah. Right? And revival of that. Yes. Over there. Hi. Hello. Sorry, I'm short too. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe the microphone stands are tall. They're, they're angled for men. Um, <laughs> um, I, I didn't hear what you said. I, I didn't hear. I just actually wanted to say something. I do have a question, I promise. Um, I just wanted to say something interesting where you talked about Me Too, but for the average woman. And um, I, I was kind of asked talking to you, bringing it up, because I thought it was really important, because we focus on these celebrities, but we kind of gets lost in the conversation about the average woman, and um, I realised that my, my mother, it happened, that sort of stuff happened to her when, I was, when she was at work, and it started happening to me, and she, a year ago when I told her about it, she said, oh, that happened to me, it just happens. And then since me too, she encouraged me to come forward, and I did, and I found out that someone who was touching me inappropriately in the workplace was touching 11 plus girls in the workplace, and he got fired because I reported it. Yeah. Yeah. And I did it because my mum supported me in it for the first time. Um, but. What I wanted to ask you guys was, um, why do you think that 
this conversation about what's happening in America and happening with Trump and American women, why do you think it's important for us Australians, but specifically Australian women, women to talk about? What, it, what are the implications in our lives in Australia? I know it's you guys, some of you, half of you American, but um, <laughs> you know, but why is this an important conversation from your perspective for us to be having in other countries? You interested in the whole panel? Um, I, I, pref I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, just a quick answer for me. Answer, Thank you, sorry. and good on you, and your mother, yes. Okay, so to respond, um, well, first, what does it mean? I mean, you've just landed here, but what does it mean? Two really, two really quick things. Firstly, Trump is fascinating. And as you pointed out earlier, we talk about him all the time. And I think mm. he's fascinating everywhere in the world. And one of our jobs is to try and sort of explain what is going on with Trump to everybody, even though we're trying to figure it out daily. So that's one thing. But then to really touch on your sexual harassment issues. And by the way, thank you for sharing those stories because it's yeah. really, really brave. Thank you. Um, um, so to just touch on that, I mean, I think that is absolutely relevant. It's relevant everywhere because I'm pretty sure that people here in the workplace are dealing with the same issues that we're dealing with in workplaces in, across the US. We've got leadership issues. We've got pay parity issues. We've got pipeline problems. We have a lot of things that need to be sorted out. And this is really the start of that conversation. So I think that you know, at least for sort of workplaces in the US, Australia, UK, parts of Europe. I mean, these are questions that we need to be having right now. So yes, it is relevant. I think the reason it's so important is that, you know, I wrote my second book, The Woman Code, is really about the connections between women. And there's something really fabulous about being a woman. And we don't say that enough. And we don't understand that we have a lot of power. And that power comes from within knowing our value and our worth. And so I think America, again, we tend to be the center of attention, whether you know, we take it, we're the center of attention. And I think that you know, it's important for women here in Australia and the UK and Africa and Asia and India and everywhere else to understand that they have a voice too and that they can do exactly what you did. It takes a spark to get a fire started. And you're seeing it happen with these women in Hollywood and regular work. Steve Wynn, the mogul, the casino mogul, got brought down for his conduct. Apparently, he had raped a woman, impregnated her back in the 60s. So he's been doing this for a long time. And now women are saying, I'm telling my story. And I want every woman and man in this room to know that your story Sharing your story can actually change and save lives when you tell the truth and you take your power back. And that's why I think it's so important to take our power back as women. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Fran, did you want to respond to that? To which? To, to the question about... No, I, really, like, I really couldn't hear her. Oh, okay. So, what, it, it was okay. Do you know what? I she think asked why is it important to the yeah, rest of the world about Donald Trump? Mm -hmm. Because who the President of the United States affects the entire world. Yep. You know, it's when, at, right after the election, an Italian friend of mine uh, said to me, it'll be okay. You know, we had Berlusconi. That was awful too. I said, yes, Berlusconi was horrible for the Italians. But Trump's going to be horrible for the whole world. Mm -hmm. You know, and it is important. It, it's not just that it seems important, or that people pretend it's important, it's really important. Donald Trump does something like spectacularly idiotic, you know, like uh, putting Tariff. tariffs on steel, you know, uh, and it's gonna affect mm. everybody in the entire mm. world. Mm -hmm. And so even the other Republicans, um, you know, the regular Republicans, who you seem to like, but I, the idea that Paul Ryan is a good person, a good Republican, you know, Paul Ryan who can't wait to get rid of Medicare, um, they're, you know, Republicans are, of course, conventionally against this kind of thing because it's bad for business. Okay, so if people are surprised that Trump did something bad for business, that's because there's still apparently people who think Trump was a businessman. But he never was. He was just a cheap hustler. Okay, the, people, the real estate guys in New York, who are not your most sterling group of people on the planet Earth, they looked down on him. Okay, they didn't vote for him, the real developers. Okay, so it's not at all surprising to me. It's very dangerous when there's a very bad president in the United States. It's dangerous to the world. We're still at war in Afghanistan because we had a really bad president after September 11th. Okay, we, if, if, if Al Gore had been the president, we would have invaded Afghanistan. Why would we have? Okay, mm. he knew where it was. Okay, but George Bush didn't. 
All right, so, you know, it's very important to the President of the United States is no matter where you live, that may not be something that you like. You may be, like, irritated. Why, you know, am I in Australia and have to worry about who the President of the United States is when no one in the United States not only knows who the Prime Minister of Australia is, but even knows where it is, okay? <laughs> Including me. I was completely flabbergasted, and it's really far. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but... The Prime Minister it, was just in America, the uh, Yes, Australian and I, Prime the Minister Prime Minister was in the United States. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was like worried for six months about this plane trip, and I saw on the news that he was at the White House, and I called someone and I said, do you know when he's going back? <laughs> because I thought, I can get a ride with him. <laughs> you know, the ride here was um, difficult. It was, uh, I'll never do that night ride again. It was just mm. frightening. It was just dark. <laughs> dark, dark, <laughs> and we hit turbulence, and I was like, oh, hell, this is over. I'm going to die in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Anyway, so but it's all didn't. good. I didn't. Thank God for that. That's good. All right, we've probably got time for almost just one more, but can I go down to you? Yes. I'm wondering what your views are on the NRA and Trump. Ooh. Well, I'll start. <laughs> Sorry, NRA. Oh, your views on the NRA and Trump. As a former member of the NRA, uh, again, in the South, raised military family, guns are part of my life since I can remember. Um, I believe strongly in the Second Amendment. I believe in all the amendments to the U.S. Constitution. But there comes a point where you have to say, wait a minute, um, human life is more valuable and what happened in Parkland with the shooting and the way that those young people have responded is amazing. And corporations are reacting, uh, sporting goods stores, whether it's Walmart or Dick's, even Kroger. I had no idea Kroger sold guns. That's a grocery store in the South. <laughs> uh, yes, and, and where I live in Virginia, for example, you can walk in any store, uh, any gun shop. You can, you get a background check. It takes them about 10 minutes. And... The problem with background checks is, if I'm a sane person and I've not ever committed any crimes, it doesn't mean I might not go commit one after I go buy an arsenal of weapons. And in Virginia, you can literally buy hand grenades in a store. You can buy, you can, I'm not making this up, you can buy all, you could buy cache of weapons, tons of ammo, and nobody's gonna say anything to you. So there comes a point, all the polling data shows this in America that the vast majority of Americans, including gun owners like myself and Second Amendment people, believe that we need some gun control, believe that AR-15s aren't necessary to protect your home. A good shotgun will do the trick for you. So y y you don't need to have the weapon that's going to go through the walls and kill the whole neighborhood. That's not what you need. <laughs> so I think that we're going to see some movement. I think that Trump flip-flopped again. It looked like he was headed in the right direction, mm. and then the NRA came and had dinner at the White House, and then he flipped. So I'm not sure where we're going to end up, but I'm hopeful that Republicans and Democrats alike realize that the children's lives matter more. Uh, we're not, nobody's going to take our guns in America. That's just a stupid, dumb, ridiculous argument. It's not going to happen. But you don't need to have a weapon of mass destruction is what I like to call it. So I'm hopeful there'll be some reform that will save us from ever seeing something so horrible again. That won't happen. <laughs> it won't happen. I don't believe in the Second Amendment, by the way. You know, I don't believe it. You know. <clears throat> you know, you know by, by, which I, by which I mean I don't believe that it means that individuals can have weapons. You know, I believe that it means what it says, which is you can raise a militia. The big fear of the founders was that someone would declare themselves a king. Right. You know, uh, they, you know, so I do not think that people should have guns. Um, New York City has really strong gun laws. Uh, for instance, if you, ha if you were found to have possession of a gun in New York, you go to jail for one year, even if you didn't use it, you know, and I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, so I don't believe in the Second Amendment. I don't believe this is going to change. You know, the NRA, when I was young, um, was a hunting organization. You know, I mean, they, I used to see their magazines. They would show people like hunting ducks. I'm not opposed to hunting, I eat animals. You know, one of the problems with the left is they started going against guns because of hunting. And I would argue with people, you know, and saying, you know, unless you're a vegan, in which case I probably don't know you that well, um, 
you know, I don't want to hear about ducks and rabbits. I don't want to hear about it. You know, I care about human beings. I don't think animals are equivalent to human beings. I'm sorry. I know you're supposed to care about it, but I don't. You know, and you are going to, but no one hunts, you know, rabbits or whatever they eat with these guns. They use a long gun, a rifle, which you can't put in your pocket and get onto the subway with because people would see it. So, you know, I've shot a handgun in my life, and there is the second you shoot a gun like that, you know what it's for. It's for shooting human beings. That's what those guns are for, you know. And I would suggest the best way to protect yourself is to live in New York City and have a doorman. <laughs> If only it were that simple. If only we all could. Yes. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm going to try and just sort of take a little bit of a different answer to your question to try and sort of move it forwards a bit. And I think you know we've talked a lot about um, activism, marches, all of the sort of groundwork that has been laid since I <coughs> became president, with you know the women's marches coming out. And I think what is really, really interesting to see right now are these. Um, students who are teenagers who are coming out and saying, just like women had said a few months ago, enough is enough. We're not going to stand for this. This is how. This is what we believe. In a few years' time, they're going to be voters, and you know they're coming out and they're marching and they're making their voices heard. And frankly, if you've listened to some of the speeches that they're giving, they're really very impressive. They're remarkably well-spoken and poised and really making legitimate arguments that I think it's very hard to keep sort of, just like the Me Too thing, it's very hard not to hear it. The, the noise is getting very loud. So I think, you know, we, we sort of think a lot about sort of where is this going from here? And we've had so many gun incidents in the US at, you know, what we call soft targets. It's not just schools, it's universities, it's, ch oh, it's churches, it's supermarkets and movie theaters and, the, and, you know, the people who are in the line of fire are there, are just the people who happen to be there at that moment. I mean, it's, it's devastating. But I think these kids basically standing up and saying, we've had enough and we're ready to do something, I think that's worth, worth watching. Mm. <clears throat> I feel so regretful that we've reached the end of the hour. I just want to pull out a bottle of whiskey and keep going, but, um, and everyone else could have something too, but um, I, um, I can't hear. am so grateful for these women and for their time. There's going to be, um, Sophia's um, going to be signing books, and you are afterwards, Fran, maybe, or after your talk. Anyways, a couple of us signing books. I'm signing two about something not relevant about a nasty woman um, <laughs> who once lived in history. And I just want to take a moment to appreciate the three women that we have on this stage. And hang on a minute. <laughs> and just each of them, I just want to say, Francesca, thank you for the reporting that you are doing that has reverberated around the world. It's been so crucial in amplifying the voices and concerns of women. And it has meant so much to all of us. Sophia, your voice as a woman of colour, a moderate Republican, is crucial. And we want you to run. We want to see you in the White House. So let's wait to see if that ends up happening. And Fran, you're just so fabulous. I'm glad you exist. And I want you... <laughs> I'm not the first person to say this, but you know, like, you do belong on the Supreme Court, and that would be fantastic, <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> um, anyway, finally, thanks to these women. Um, we'll see you in the lobby, and thanks so much for your attention today. Thank Cheers. You.